Kevin Garnett pioneered the youth movement into the NBA. People wanted him to fail. No one thought he could make it. I was so ready to prove everybody wrong. Beyond the Glory, next on Fox Sports Net. Michael Jordan was going Michael Jordan. You draft him at 13. You didn't know. My God, how can you be that good and be that young and be in the pros? But what if the NBA revolution was ignited by pure chance? I see these cats fighting. Dang, he getting beat down. I'm like lynching. That's the soft for you. Had that not happened, would he have gone straight to the NBA? Nothing nobody could have done to stop this young man. A part of me was like, they get me, they get the animal. A straight, untamed pit bull, that's what they get. This is Kevin Garnett. Beyond the glory. October 1st, 2003, one day before the start of training camp. I'm happy to know that I'm going to be in Minnesota for the rest of my life. Kevin Garnett signs a five-year contract extension with the team that drafted him straight out of high school. I'm excited for the fans. I'm excited for the city. I'm excited, for real. <laughs> really, really excited. Hey, hey, Sid, we can do anything right He's now. always kept some of that innocence. He came in as the kid, and, and uh, he's now the man. He's all of 27 years old. Kevin Garnett changed the game. This past year, there were five high school players drafted. It all began with Kevin Garnett. He was not the first high school basketball player to turn pro. Just the first to make it look easy. My life is like a story. Y'all feel me? You know, sometimes you go through hard things, and today might be difficult. But if you hang in there and continue to work and continue to strive and don't let things set you back, even though that's easier said than done, it's, you know, the circle's going to come back around, you know. The sun always shines, it's just sometimes some clouds there, you know what I'm saying? The basketball phenomenon known as the kid may never have happened, if not for a bizarre chain of real life events that could only have happened in the heart of Dixie. This is country, it's the dirty south. He was born in Greenville, a town so tucked away in the mountains of South Carolina that Confederate deserters came here to hide during the Civil War. It's a beautiful city. That's why I call it Greenville. Such a green city. In the early 70s, Shirley Garnett worked the production line at the 3M plant, where she fell in love with a local hero. O. Lewis McCullough would father her only son. He was a very prominent basketball player. Highly sought out athlete. Yes, he was one of the stars during our era. He was about 6'5". Really, really shoot the ball. It was really, really fast. I would not say he wasn't in his life, but they, they weren't as close as they should have been. My mom never bashed on me, never, she never talked down on him. I always tell people this, my mom was my mom and my dad.
Kevin was the second of Shirley's three children. When he was four, he met his best friend for life, Jamie Peters, nicknamed Junebug. Jamie had a Mickey Mouse watch. Did he tell you about the Mickey Mouse watch? I remember he had a Flintstone watch. It was Mickey Mouse. I remember well. It was Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse tape. Calculate the watch. Mm. Bud left the watch with Kevin. And they have been friends ever since. By the time Kevin was 12, his mother had remarried and moved the family to the suburb of Malden into Bug's neighborhood. It was a neighborhood where the blacks were just, I was in the middle class. And there weren't many blacks in Malden, by the way. She quit the factory and started her own business, a beauty shop she ran out of the house. She used to have us doing little odd jobs like sweeping up hair on the floor, you know, collecting towels and washing them. I used to sterilize the combs, take the wraps off the rollers. A lot of good stories in the, in the women's salon, better than a barber shop, to tell you the truth. Growing up, Kevin towered over kids the same age. He looked like a basketball player long before he could ever play. I was terrible. I mean, you think you just grab the ball, you shoot, and it goes in, and it's not that easy. But basketball was the neighborhood game. Kevin and Bug became regulars at Springfield Park. I got to speed down, just outplayed, and just embarrassed a lot of times. You know, I've always been competitive, and it just drove me. We play from sun up to sundown. First thing you hear in the morning being that we live across the street from is basketball, bouncing. Do, 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 do. Kevin put that ball up. On Basswood Drive, his game would grow by leaps and bounds. Everybody was like, you know, why don't you go out for varsity or whatever? But I knew my mom wasn't going to let me play. I just knew. My mom was um, a type of mother who really wanted us to focus on school. And anything other than that, or that would take our mind off of that, she just wasn't having it. <laughs> There's two things I'm scared of in life. That's God and my mom. <laughs> he knew I would have said no. With his best friend's encouragement, Kevin secretly showed up for the basketball tryouts his freshman year. I can Kevin not play on the team. <laughs> he had to be on the team, man. Yeah. They would always send a permission slip home to sign, but Bud would always be the one to sign the permission slip. But organized basketball is nothing like the playground. First day of practice, we didn't touch a ball. Second night of practice, we didn't touch a ball. There's more to playing basketball than shooting a basketball and dribbling it. I can tell right away he was like my mom. Wanted to be in control. Would let you know that this is his gym. He doesn't need you. Whether he liked it or not, Kevin thrived on the discipline. I could teach him a drill at practice, and he could teach it as good as I could the next day. I mean, it was locked in. I just had this mentality that um, I'm a kid and I'm here to be seen, not heard. You know, that's how my mom taught us to be. But he could not hide his talent. As a freshman starter playing against boys two and three years older, Kevin averaged 13 points, 14 rebounds, and seven block shots a game. You dream of coaching somebody like that. You dream of coaching somebody that you can send to a big school. College coaches a thousand miles from Malden would know about Kevin's potential before his mother ever even knew he played a game. I always like put my bag outside my window. He would be like, Ash, I'm gonna go up to the park for a little while. Could you just tell mom I'm at Bug's house or something? He would leave leave the game and go home and, and climb through the window in his bedroom as though he never had left to play. That's how I went for like a year and a half, almost two years. But the double life would catch up to KG. His newfound celebrity would make him a target. Kevin got pointed out. Of course, you know, the first person you're gonna see is gonna be him. Here you facing 15 to 20 years, can you imagine? The only thing I can remember hearing is my mom's voice like, don't get caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Kid 
is known for his game face. It's a childlike exuberance. It can be taken to a frightening extreme. Kevin Garnett began his basketball life as a much different player. Whoa! The way I was taught, it was like, you go out and try to you know, rip somebody's head off and throw an elbow and, you know, I wasn't taught to do it with joy, you know. In 1992, KG was a freshman playing on the varsity team for Coach Duke Fisher in tiny Malden, South Carolina. I dunked the ball, I would hit a three, and I would celebrate, and he would start practice, and I would run while the other people practice. So he sort of broke you down mentally, just to let you know that don't ever get bigger than the team, because without the team, you're nothing. I still use that to this day. Coach Fisher knew exactly what he had. I had played some at North Carolina, and so I called Dean Smith. I said, he's about 6'7", and he's just a freshman. And he can shoot, rebound, pass, you name it. We sit in total amazement watching this young man play. It was Bob Gibbons' job to find the best high school talent in the country. He and a colleague stumbled onto Kevin in 1993 while scouting another player from a town 20 miles away. We met with Duke Fisher. I said, I think Kevin's a junior. He said, no, he's just a 10th grader. And that made it all the more amazing what he was able to do. I thought he had a all right game. They thought he was fantastic. And they, they invited him to Nike camp. That was his sophomore year. In the basketball world, Kevin was about to become a household name in his own home. His mother had no idea he was even on a team. I'm gonna tell you how I got caught. My mom was doing some young lady's hair and she needed her hair done before the game. They told her that Kevin was playing and she was like, no, you know, I know everything about my kids. And they was like, no, he's playing and he's good and this and that and the other. So I got in the car and the first thing my mom said, go to the school. She was like, I don't, I don't understand why he wouldn't tell me and he knows I, I don't want him to play basketball. It's just gonna take up too much time and practice. And you know, she was just rambling, rambling, rambling. And I walked around and at the back of the gymnasium and you just hear the noise and all the drama. You know, when you see it come in, you automatically think, the game about to stop. <laughs> I think Bud gave Kevin the idea that mom was at the door. And all of a sudden he looks up <laughs> and the people in the gym, they didn't know what was wrong because he sees me. She looked right at me. She said, your ass is mine when you get home. But in that moment, Shirley Garnett saw her only son in a brand new light. It was unbelievable to me to see him playing ball like this, dunking. I mean, dunking. I was scared to go home. I was scared to go home. I just became his biggest, biggest fan, and I'm his biggest critic. Still to this day, it applies. By age 16, he was not just Shirley's son, he was Malden's. Kevin kind of reminded me when he was coming through Malden, bringing a town together, bringing a community together. It was more than the whole town of Malden. It was the whole county of Greenville, and it, it, it spread to the whole upstate, really. I mean, he was, he was known by everyone. <laughs> Kevin was a complete unknown in Indianapolis that summer. He accepted Bob Gibbons' offer to attend the Nike All-American camp. Kevin walks in, and I start laughing. I say, hold up, man. How you gonna give me this cat, man? He's like, he's like 16 and super skinny, and I grab his uh, forearm and say, what's this? From Baldwin, South Carolina. As a first year coach at the camp, William Wolf Nelson was given a low profile team to compete in the week long tournament. It was the year Allen Iverson came after he had been charged with assault back in his hometown of Hampton, Virginia. 
And that was the uh, first time that a, a camp all-star game was nationally televised. He has the reputation of perhaps being Iverson the best had a reputation. Garnett made me in a matter of days. Garnett, who delivers to tie the contest. Kevin ducks on somebody, and I call him to the side. I say, Kevin, come here. Come over here. Kevin runs over there. You know, like, did I do something wrong? I said, what was that? That was the city dunk. The next time you dunk it, you want to dunk it a little bit harder, man. I mean, I need some excitement. I need some emotion. And with that, the kid was unleashed. Oh, man! The Mackie Walker finds Garnett. It's looked by Walker. Go a little slip screen off on the inside, and again, another dunk, and this time Kevin Garnett buries it. He was the best player of the best of the best. He became a, a, an overnight uh, national uh, figure. And he came back home. It was like a, just a different kid as far as basketball goes. Man, it was like, it was different. <laughs> I'm in books and Streets and Smith and honorable mention and whatever, whatever. It got to the point where he got so much mail when he was a junior that they'd send it to me. And I thought, golly, this is great. I've never gotten this much mail in my life. Recruiters were relentless. I changed telephone numbers several times. But they still would get it. One guy called me one night. I'm not going to call his name. He was a big coach. He said, man, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's changing phone numbers. We have sources. After his junior season in 1994, Kevin was named South Carolina's Mr. Basketball, the first time an underclassman had ever won the award. His future seemed as rock solid as the granite surrounding Greenville. Kevin wanted to attend college. That was his dream. He wanted to attend school. That dream began to slip away. The last week of school at Malden High. I see this, these cats fighting. So I was bugging myself. Dang, he getting beat down. It's like a blur now. Because everything started happening so fast after that. South Carolina would implode in the spring of 1994. It was last day of school for seniors. In the school, you get like a 15-minute break, so usually when the break comes, you know, you get you get to um, go downstairs, get you like a little snack or something, you know, look at the chicks. <laughs> Holler at your boys, y'all down there cracking jokes for about 10 minutes, whatever. So on this certain day, you know, seniors got this thing where at the end of the year, you know, they're seniors, they you know, about to graduate. You know, whoever they got problems with, you know, they go, they go find this person and, you know, they get it on. One kid who got roughed up was white. By day's end, three black kids were in jail charged with lynching in the second degree. Lynching, by definition, is mob action. It's action by uh, two or more people to uh, commit a violent injury to another person. It's a statute from the Deep South, originally intended to prevent mob actions by whites against blacks. It's still a law, and it's still in our discipline code. We don't call it lynching in the school district. We, call, we may call it ganging, uh, but we don't call it lynching, but the law itself does say lynching. 
I know it connotes a lot of uh, bad things, but in fact, uh, it's many people are charged with lynching in South Carolina. It's basically fighting. Under the law, anyone judged to be part of the mob who does not try to stop the violence can also be charged with lynching. As the investigation materialized uh, through the police department and us, uh, we did learn that Kevin was with the group. It was like a lot of us, you know, down, down there. While that was going on, and of course, you know, the first person you're gonna see is gonna be him. Next day in school, a couple of teachers come up to me. It's like, yo, you know, we hear that, you know, the police want to talk to you, and you was caught in his altercation or whatever. You know what happened? And we sat in my doorway with him in a chair and me in a chair, and he just said. I didn't do anything. I was just there. Kevin always wanted to be accepted. He felt odd because of his size and because of his notoriety. And he, he just wanted to be one of the fellas. Here's a guy, six foot 11, who stands very popular in school, who stands out. He's the star basketball player. If he's in a crowd, why wouldn't he be noticed? I mean, he would tower above everyone else. They came and got him from school, which made it kind of bad. I pop up and I'm getting ready to dart. I jump over, you know, a couple of deaths. I'm dart. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm running for, right? But I'm shook, so I, I'm getting ready to jet out. The teacher, Miss Willoughby, she goes, Kevin, don't even run. If you ain't doing anything, don't run. You're innocent of this. You tell me this. Go with them. It'll all work out. And I did ask the police not to put handcuffs on him. It's like, like 12 cops out there. <laughs> As soon as he grabbed me, he started reading me rights and he cuffed me. And he take me down to the Lake County and all that. Everything else is like a blur. I went down to the mall in the police office and there sat Kevin crying. I never have seen him look like that. I, to look on his face and I'm like, what in the world is happening? The reigning Mr. Basketball had been charged with lynching in the second degree. Kevin and five others faced the possibility of 20 years behind bars. I know he would never harm a fly, not Kevin. And to go down to the police station here, you facing 15 to 20 years, can you imagine? Well, it's hard to believe. I thought, you know, it's just something that go away after a day or so, but uh, they stayed out. And then, you know, it got worse as far as him not being able to play basketball for Marlin and all this stuff. He'd been expelled from school. His senior year of eligibility was now in question. My mom was like, you, you can't, you know, they had obviously kicked me out of school to expel me from school. And she was like, I'm getting you out of South Carolina. I truly believe Kevin Garnett did nothing other than stand there and witness an incident, a schoolyard incident that took place and could have happened in any school in America. The shock of the charge reverberated all the way to Chicago, site of the 1994 Nike summer camp. They said, you know, Kevin's not coming back. He's not coming to camp this year. I'm like, what do you mean Kevin's not coming to camp? Nike was kind of hesitant because of the Aunt Allen Iverson situation the year before that. You know, Allen got in trouble. They brought him to camp in the media. You know, they, they sort of crucified him. You know, how you know how could you? You know, you're putting basketball over these kids and this, that, and the other. So I said, well, Kevin has a situation out there where he got involved in the fight. And I started laughing because Kevin, that's not Kevin. My reaction was, if Kevin Garnett doesn't come to the camp, I'm not staying at the camp. I've got all the rosters, the schedules. I'm getting on the plane and going back to Charlotte. So we better talk about this. Nike relented. Kevin was reunited with Coach Wolf Nelson. How you doing? Thank you, Louis. <laughs> when he got there, you could tell it was like, I'm ready to roll, man. You know, I'm here, I'm ready to do my thing. And he did his thing. <laughs> he did his thing. Kevin solidified his title as the best high school prospect in the country. His 
mother laid the groundwork for their escape from the South. She said, I'm not going to sit back and let them destroy my baby. You know, I'm not going to just sit right here and let them just take him down like they're trying to take him down. And they would try to, they would try to dog him. It was a destiny call. It was a wake up call. That's all I can say. And I, I just, I see it no other way. Back in South Carolina, Kevin applied for a program called pretrial intervention. Pretrial intervention is a uh, program, a diversion program for basically first time youthful offenders. With the consent of the authorities and the victim of the crime, Kevin was given a chance to clear his name through community service. If they complete the program, pass all drug tests, don't get into trouble again, do all their public service, then uh, instead of a diploma, they get an expungement order. In other words, they never have to go to court and their arrest record is expunged. That fall, he left the South for good. Shirley left behind a husband and a business and moved her son and youngest daughter to Chicago. I was just so depressed, man. Just totally depressed. You know, I just felt like it was my, it was my fault that everything was going down, down the drain, so to speak. I really, truly don't believe that we knew what we had when we had Kevin Garnett here at Mall. You know, maybe it was a blessing in the sky, though, because he probably wouldn't have went the pro the way he did if he had stayed at Mall and something. Had that not happened, would he have gone to Chicago? Would he have gone straight to the NBA? We'll never know. Sports writers claimed it was a mistake. He'd never make it. He was too young, too immature. All those people that were saying that couldn't even get through, not even half of what I've been through. That was my edge. I was like, it can't be no hard in Chicago. It can't be this hard. Now he asked me to come with him. See, that's how he did it, you know. You want to come to Chicago with me? Yeah. They were 18, country boys who felt betrayed by their little hometown. Chicago is like nothing I've seen in my life. You know, it was rough. I remember calling Taylor Bell with the Chicago Sun-Times and telling him, you're getting the best high school player in the country. In the spring of 1994, Kevin had been charged in connection with a schoolyard fight he claims he had nothing to do with. Four months later, they fled South Carolina for the Windy City. The school was Farragut Academy. Kevin had latched onto Coach William Wolf Nelson after two summers playing for him at the Nike summer camp. At first, the adjustment was sort of tough for Kevin. Like I said, it's like he's just overwhelmed when you know you look at the school and make the school. It's like wow, you know, it's like another world. First couple of days of school was hard. It's an all Hispanic school. Maybe 4,000 kids, you got 100 black kids. You know, having things like what we had going on at our school and then getting to a school and it's what? One white kid there? It was like, man. <laughs> I didn't even know places like this existed. First day, man, we in the, we in the lunchroom and the lunchroom is dead silent. We were sitting there at the table, and people were staring at us. And a, a hot dog just come right over my shoulder, boom, boom. And I was like, oh, God. And bugging myself, turned around, and he was like, no, no 
basically told everybody in there, <laughs> we kick their ass if this happened again. <laughs> everybody wasn't wasn't always nice, you know, and oh, like these people are crazy. He said, I just can't take it. So he left. I told Ken, we're not going. We're gonna fight it in. He had the basketball team, you know, they were like a cohesive group, you know. He had those guys. Chicago let me be me. Wolf gave me the, the ultimate freedom to enjoy the game and to show everything you can do. Kevin wanted to play some hard nosed basketball. He wanted to be challenged, you know. So where I took him was basically where I grew up at, it was just tough around there. He loved that. He was like, yeah, I like that. Don't take me to the other park no more. <laughs> I want to go hang out with these guys. Martin Luther King Jr. kept an apartment in this neighborhood. One block from where it burned to the ground stands a youth center more than 100 years old. This was in like the heart and soul of the ghetto, 16th Street, the Holy City. Kids like KG come here to test their game against the neighborhood players. In Chicago, basketball is the sport. You know, it's like what soccer is overseas. It's like everything. As a high school player, his game was incomparable. But his future would be determined by how he scored in the classroom. I'm going to college. I'm going to college. I'm not, I'm not going to skip. You know, it's just no later or nothing. When I qualify, you know, I'm going to college, I'm pick a school, and I'm going to be a regular kid. That's it. One of the factors that led to Garnett changing the whole face of what happens now in the pros and high school basketball players was that he did not have the option to go to college. I was having difficulties passing the SAT. To be eligible for a major college scholarship, Student athletes must reach a minimum score on one of the standardized college entrance exams. Every time he'd take it, he would keep getting the same damn score, and I kept looking like. I just know from talking with college coaches who did get his academic transcript that he, you know, he was not close. The dramatic turn their lives were taking did not help. Keep in mind, I was married at the time. And my uh, ex husband had a stroke, and he had called me, and I had to come home to take care of that man. Myself and Ashley was left up in Chicago for about, about nine, almost like ten months. And um, it was hell. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment on the south side of Chicago, the same building as Coach Nelson. We lived on the 12th floor and he lived on the 11th floor, so we were always down there either eating or he was up there, so he, he was a big help, he was. I don't know what we would have done without him. Kevin turned to his talent to provide. Play for some of the cats in the neighborhood just to get money. I would uh, save that money, come in, we'd break the money down, or, okay, this is for laundry. There were times when, um, we didn't really have groceries or, you know, we needed money to wash clothes. I was doing every little thing I had to do to get through it and grind, and I knew I was weighing down on my mom. And, you know, it don't matter if I get 30 jobs or if I play for whoever, I got to do something, you know? The best high school player in America faced the prospect of junior college or no college at all. In Chicago, his game had flourished at the expense of everything else. With his mother gone, his money running short, and his time running out, Kevin Garnett boldly defied basketball tradition. May 10th, I declare myself eligible for the NBA draft. I have not yet received my SAT score and expect to receive them in the next two or three weeks. Some sports writers contended Kevin had been influenced into an irrevocable mistake. People ask me, how can I allow him to make that move? And he orchestrated the whole thing, and I just sat back and said, y'all just don't know how smart that guy is. That guy, it's like, it's almost like he said, this is where I want to be, and this is how I want to do it, and he made it happen. He scheduled a workout 
for NBA executives a few weeks before draft day. We ended up in the lottery getting the fifth pick. We were going to tell everybody that we were going to take this high school kid with the idea that somebody else in front of us would get kind of excited and say, hey, maybe they see something that we don't. Somebody else would take him and we'd be left with one of those other four players. About 10 minutes into the workout, I turned to Kevin McHale and I said, hey, we better hope this kid's there at number five. Kevin says on draft day, he was standing at the crossroads of his life. The phone rang. It was Wolf, my coach. In fact, he's like, I was cleaning my office, and I found these uh, scores in here. I'm like, what? What scores? Like the SAT score. I was like, word. He's like, yeah, man, you passed, man. I was like, oh, word. Next 30 minutes, probably the best 30 minutes of my life. With the fifth pick in the 1995 NBA draft, the Minnesota will select Kevin Garnett from Farragut Academy in Chicago. Kevin Garnett changed the game. Kevin was the one that kind of led the way. But an invitation to join the club doesn't mean that you belong. You step up to that jump ball and you look at the guy across you and say, hey, look, I'm going to kick your ass. And then you got to go out there and do it. There's nobody holding your hand. I had serious doubts that he was strong enough to play against a Carl Malone or a Shaquille O'Neal. I thought they were just absolutely battering. Times and I think I was going to make it. I'm going to make this. Just if I got to die here today, I'm, I'm going to make this. Beyond the Glory on Fox Sports Net is brought to you by Dodge. You could take life as it comes or you could grab life by the horns. Dodge. Some of the most celebrated players in the NBA today began their pro careers before they could even order a drink. They all stand on the shoulders of Spencer Haywood. In a case argued before the Supreme Court in 1971, Haywood won the right for undergraduates to earn a living in the NBA. In the 25 years between Haywood and Kevin Garnett, only three other high school kids even tried it. We went to play the Los Angeles Lakers, and Cedric Sabalas was playing for him. Sabalas was matched up on KG, and he went right around him and scored. Turns and faces, turn back to him he says you know this isn't high school he got that everywhere people wanted him to fail no one thought he could make it it just fueled me it fueled me i was so ready to prove everybody wrong Savalas would finish his career as a journeyman within one year 19 year old kg was a dominant force a superstar in the making Kevin Garnett started this trend of high school players skipping college and going straight to the NBA. Players are now more tuned in to the realities of their chances to be successful in the pros. The key to KG's success lies in the struggle he endured to get there. Kevin was a bit unique in the fact that he did leave Malden, uh, South Carolina, and go to Chicago. He was kind of on his own for a while. And I think that served him very, very well. Kevin made that move out of happenstance. A schoolyard skirmish that could have happened anywhere. A size and stature that ensured he'd be singled out. An archaic law that would threaten his future. And a bold move to save his career. I want to play basketball and someday be in the NBA. I want to be out of this predicament that I was in. You can't keep a truly great player down. You can't, it's just not gonna happen. In 1997, 
Kevin Garnett led Minnesota to its first playoff appearance in franchise history. He was rewarded with the richest contract in professional sports history. From day one, he's played like he has to prove he's worth every penny. Even at 19, he was a leader of our team. You know, this franchise, when you think of the Timberwolves, you think of Kevin Garnett. KG has taken the Timberwolves to the postseason each year since then. His team has yet to win a playoff series. Got to get past the first round. And it's not a bad question. It's not a question that I'm tired of either. It's the question that's really driving me. If I can name a bunch of guys that were very, very good players that you guys would probably do a show on, and that 20 years later no one mentions them because they didn't win championships. His legacy in Minnesota is yet to play out, but the kid will always be a legend in Malden, South Carolina. He has a desire to be a great basketball player, and he has a sense of history, and he has a respect for the game. Those same things that make him a great basketball player also make him a great person because he has a sense of community about him and he wants to be a good citizen. You know, I always tell young kids who are you know, thinking about coming to the NBA, it is difficult and you gotta maintain and sort of manage yourself. And I don't think young kids sometimes understand that. So when I talk to them, I talk from a real perspective. Put it on the bottom or top? On the bottom, right? Not just basketball because that would probably be the easiest. You know? Life is a whole, whole nother game.